because we have three invited speakers today that will be talking about data standards, metadata, and repositories, and give us a very broad overview over what there is to know about these topics. So we'll spend the first uh, 35, 40 minutes listening to the talks. And after that, we will uh, have some discussions in breakout groups to get to know each other a bit better and also to discuss about what we have just heard and what we know otherwise. But I'll, uh, I'll give more details about how we're going to do that after the presentations. And with that, I think I will just go ahead and head over to Anders Finstad, who is a professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And he is also a GBIF ambassador here in Norway. And Anders will be telling us a bit about data standards. So take it away, Anders. Oh, better if I unmute, probably. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes telling you about data standards, or rather, I'm going to talk about data standards through my ecological Googles, which is the practitioner's view. This means that this will not be a part of technical introduction. Uh, first of all, that would be uh, way too much in 15 minutes, and it's also be pretty dry. Uh, so my intention is first to give a bit of motivation, give a bit of introduction of what we have, and also a bit of uh, just saying it is doable. Now, starting with what data standards are, uh, data standards are basically agreements about how we document uh, uh, the representation, the format, the definition, structuring of data, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why do we need such agreements? Why do we need actually to agree upon this? Uh, we want to communicate. We want our data to talk together. And if we don't communicate, uh, everything goes bad. Our data can't talk together, we can't use them with our own or other data sets, and it all turns out in a biblical confusion, and we will see the end to society as we know it, etc., etc. So bad things will happen, basically. We want our data somehow standardized. Uh, not at least, since this is one of the cornerstones of the FAIR principles, uh, you would see that one of the keystones of this is interoperable data. A cornerstone of interoperable data is that they talk together, and meaning that they have the same vocabularies, they have also the same technical uh, coding that make them fit together and make machines understand them. Now, in a narrow sense, uh, this is such as data, making data interoperable. I mean, a very, very basic example of what you could say a standard is, is a way to express dates. Uh, it's a very common program uh, issue. And uh, you have an ISO set of standards that uh, tells you how to uh, you, uh, express dates. Uh, it is uh, very often, expressed in very many other formats and you will see that this is not uh, good if you want to have your data uh, flow together either if you want to make your data interoperable with your own existing data that you have recorded previously you need to have the dates formatted the same uh, way uh, it's uh, if you want to have them interoperable with your future data that you will collect in uh, five years time it want, you want to have them interoperable with your research group's data, and you will have them to flow together with data in an institutional, national, global, et cetera, type of data pool. Now, standardization recognition can therefore be very broad or it can be very narrow. Um, so I talk 
in the narrower sense about the individual researcher, simply because we all do standardize our data to some degree, simply because we need to understand them ourselves. But we often have colleagues and we have institutions that also use the same data and they need to understand them and they need to bring them together. But we also have national and international organizations and systems for bringing the data together. And the further we go, the broader recognition of standards of data we need, and the more difficult it all becomes. So there are, of course, besides the interoperability of the data, a lot of advantages of having your data standardized. It's the reproducibility. It means that the data will be understandable by other humans and machines than your own computer and your own self, uh, so that others might be able to reproduce and understand your research. It has to do with data integrity. Your quality of the data will, of course, be easier to check and verify. Um, so one of the things that has uh, uh, kind of been, when it comes to ecological data, um, and uh, kind of uh, um, trouble, troublesome part of it is that ecological data has been viewed as very, very heterogeneous. And it has partly to do by the mass of various ways to sample and collect data about biodiversity uh, that range from traps, from, uh, from sampling gears, from molecular methods to pure observations, etc. And all this heterogeneity data has, has uh, led to the one of the one of the questions that one of the challenges of ecological data standardization is in creating a way of representing the many possible ways that the ecological data can be integrated. Now, as such, this has been put forward as one of the barriers to publishing and reuse and a verification, as I call it, of, of ecological data. Uh, so. There are several layers of this. Uh, it's first about finding a common way of understanding your data or the data model, how are they fit together. It's about vocabularies to represent your uh, data in a thematic way. So what does your different data points represent? And it's about the technical standards, what sort of the technical representations, for example. Um, and I think one of my points is that ecological data is not really that different from each other, not that disparate. They are very different traditions within our discipline of expressing them. This has to do both with the way we collect the data, as I said, but it also has to do with the way we analyze them and which software we use to, to display and store them. So there will be very different way in how data look uh, for humans. If we store them in a spreadsheet, if we store them in a long format, if we store them in a wide format, for example, uh, or if you have them in a GIS software, or if you have them in a, in a traditional relational database. The cornerstone is, the, however, in my belief, that uh, data are from our discipline are quite similar in their in basic structure. So. What I would put forward is that you have a conceptual schema for, for field ecological data that is more or less similar for all data you have, basically because we all are dealing with data collected at Earth, meaning they have a location. Uh, we sample or observe data at some point in time with some given methodology, giving rise to an event. And at that event, we observe something of organisms or, or parts of organisms giving rise to occurrences. So we might 
also collect materials from this and store them in museum collection or get rid of the material immediately. Now, so this conceptual schema, as I call it, may give us the opportunity to produce ways to store and to share and to exchange our data in an interoperable and standardized way. And uh, it has been done, and we are doing it right now. So much of what the, the rest of the talk will be about is uh, how GBIF and associated infrastructures are using Darwin Core and, and different uh, associated extension and standards for sharing ecological data. Um, Darwin Core is in a very broad definition a body of standards that are there to practice the facilit and facilitate the biodiversity data sharing. Uh, they have in a very narrow de and definition uh, a li it's, a, it's a library and a, and a, of biodiversity data and terms to describe biodiversity data. And as such, it uh, uh, would by some not even be recognized as a data standard in itself. It's a more of a body of terms, a collection of terms to describe data. Regardless um, that it's quite useful uh, it has a, uh, just some quickly mentions there's associated data standards or vocabularies really uh, going along with this. Um, and it would, uh, this vocabularies would look more likely like this one. Here is an example how to describe, for example, an occurrence where you have an occurrence ID, a record number, an organism ID, etc. in, in Darwin Core. Now, uh, these terms are describing different properties with what you could call records. So if we, for example, just uses a tabular, tabular view of our data, we could say that each row is a record. Now for each record, um, each term will describe the content of a field as you call it. So, for example, in this uh, instance is decimal longitude, which is the decimal degree in the longitudinal direction of the location of this record described by this term. But also you will have the values within each field that may or may not be restricted by controlled vocabularies or data types. And in case of this with the decimal longitude, this should of course be a numerical value corresponding to something between where you find the coordinates on Earth. Um, we have plenty of examples uh, now, how we are able to document and use Darwin Core and these extensions for ecological data. Um, just briefly mention that we have the ability to document and standardize species inventories, we can do panel data. We can do vegetation plots. Uh, we can do line transects. We can do quantitative monitoring. And we can do eDNA-based inventories. And camera traps has also been done. Uh, however, there are some significant challenges of the current application. So one of the most foremost ones are that there are really quite a lot of heterogeneity in the application, how we use Darwin Core and these associated body of standards. It's, an, it's a, on, for better or worse, a very loose standard in that sense that you can do this fit data according to Darwin Core and associated standards in many ways, which makes them, well, basically a little standardized, but still it uh, has on the positive side enabled us to document uh, quite a few data types using this, this uh, body of vocabularies and, and these tools. So uh, one solution to this is that we have what I call more community derived recognition 
recommendations and guides how to publish them and how to reuse ecological data, meaning that we have standards within standards or recommendations for how to actually use these standards for certain use cases, either it's camera trapped or, or line transect, or in this instance, how to publish sequence derived biodiversity data. I think also one of the problems that we have strived with within this universe is that the data model underpinning the, the exchange formats are not very suited to ecological data. So we need a more coherent data model. Uh, this is upcoming. And I certainly hope that we will have this implemented in, uh, in some time. Uh, and the GBIF Secretariat is, is uh, working quite closely on this at the moment. Um, that was all I thought I had to say about this at the moment. So I hope this was a fairly sort of broad overview of things. That was brilliant, Anders. Thank you very much. So you actually were one minute under. So if anyone has any burning questions for Anders right now, feel free to, um, I guess, raise your hand or just speak up uh, now but you can always also put it in the chat or even better in the in the slack thread and then uh, Anders can come back to it uh, at a later point in time too would anyone like to ask something before we move on does not seem to be the case. I have a question for Anders, but I'll keep it for uh, after uh, after the talk. OK, make sure you remember it. <laughs> I will. OK, then I will uh, hand over to Dimitri, who is a scientific officer at the GBIF Secretariat. And Dimitri will uh, show us that there's more than just data and introduce us to metadata and how it's being handled in practice. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very good. So um, this time I don't have slides or I thought I, I don't have slides, but then listening to Anders, I actually want to show two in the end. So um, I also decided to keep my introduction to metadata very, very simple and hopefully attractive to the ecologist's uh, audience. Um, my background is in entomology and mycology. So I started as a natural historian, but then I did a couple of postdoc projects in the Metapopulation Research Group in Helsinki, um, which was a little bit of a scary experience, I should say. You come with your species knowledge to a bunch of semi-gods, Ilka Hansky and people like him talking heavy modeling and running around with big ideas. It was definitely educational for me, but then I was also a database nerd there. And I, I was surprised by kind of, by the neglect in a way, or the very technical uh, take on the data among the ecologists. And I think it's, it's true, uh, it's changing, it's changing for the positive, uh, but it's um, the attitude to the importance of data in ecology is uh, something that um, remains a, a puzzle to me. And I think, the reason for that are actually not scientific, not technical, but cultural. And the people who work in the museum-based research and in this citizen science-based research generate and collect physical material or virtual evidence to be shared to start with. You put things into the museum so someone will come and visit and find it and use for taxonomy or phylogenetic work for morphology and things like that. Ecologists, at least in the world which is close to me, live in the project uh, mindset, the project reality. And I think this was historically also true in the times of the big expeditions. You have the expedition plan, you start, you finish, and there is a lot of data narcissism, if you like, or this kind of ownership attitudes in ecology, which are not typical for other fields in biodiversity. But um, so my start is kind of sad and skeptical, but uh, the continuation will be nice and positive, I hope. Um, what is metadata? I start first. Metadata is data about data. That's the shortest description I know. 
And the classical metaphor to talk about metadata is the packing list on your parcel. Now in the COVID, when people started to do more online shopping, you know that the box that comes to your doorstep comes sometimes with a little list of what's inside. So before you open, you or the posted people can see what is inside. That's, that's exactly what metadata is all about. The data tables standardized as Anders presented to you, they are the content, this is what you ordered, this is what you need, but the metadata basically tells what's inside. It helps sorting, it helps postage services to operate, and it is the same for the, for the biodiversity data sets. And um, it is also standardized, and uh, there is such thing um, as um, ecological metadata language. Um, can you see it on my screen now? I'm just showing you some browser tabs, uh, uh, basically to tell you that if you Google ecological metadata language, uh, you'll find a bunch of resources and guides and old and not so old best practices, uh, which tell you how to use it. I'm not going to do that today. Uh, it's technical knowledge. And if you feel it's important, you'll find out. But it's basically uh, applying the same standardization philosophy that Anders explained about data, but to the metadata. Um, I would like to give you some examples from the GBIF uh, real data sets. I'm online now showing you how metadata looks like. So this is a insect monitoring data set made on the roof of the building I'm in now. Uh, somebody operated a light trap for a very long period and generated time series. Um, to be honest, as a coleopterist, I'm not into the moths too much. So before I, you know, want to see the names uh, for real, I would like to know more about this data set. Um, you scroll down, you find some breakdown by the events, but here are your metadata categories. I, I can make it a little bit larger maybe. So you can see in sections, description, purpose, temporal scope, geographic scope. I, I, imagine I'm looking at this from outside Denmark. I don't know exactly where Copenhagen Museum is. So that little dot here uh, tells me that geographically it's very boring data set. It's very, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a literally single dot, but temporally it's a very interesting data set because it's a huge range of years. So if I would be in phenology, but not into distribution, for me, that would be very attractive. So this, how is your human interest as a potential reuser of the data is shaped and directed by what is inside. Once again, I didn't open the data table and I'm not planning to do it in front of you because we're talking about metadata. Taxonomic scope, again, see, I'm coleopterist. I think it's all about moss, but hey, look, 467 species of coleoptera. That sounds interesting. Maybe I will open this data. Maybe there are my favorite families among those things. But if it, it is light strapping, and I like beetles who are living in fungi, so I'm, I would like to read um, what exactly was the, the method, what exactly was the trap, Maybe it was the wrong kind. Maybe they use a different wavelength that doesn't work on my beetles or whatever. So you check this. And uh, then there is bibliography and contexts that, that uh, um, some are still alive, others not. That you, that, uh, and this would be uh, your metadata experience in real life. So if I would be doing some kind of meta-analysis or comparing Lepidoptera dynamics, across Northern Europe. I would like to see if people who operated this trap did something comparable to what I did with my traps. Or you want to deduce some temporal shifts or seasonal shifts in the Lepidoptera and you can just use reuse that very data set without doing anything else. Or you think you could continue, you think the climate changed so much that you want to pick that very same methodology and make season two for the same experiment and submit a grant proposal and then you will have a good basis for this. So this is a positive example. And this was manually prepared by metadata authors of this of this data set. And I helped a little bit with, with Kyle Bragg. So first three people wrote the paper, a classical ecological research with a pinch of natural history. We helped to put it digitally alive and this is and it is now here online. You can go and explore metrics. 
and see what is the taxonomic breakdown. As we observed already, Coleoptera are in minority and things like that. So data come through GBIF and other discovery platform through standardization, but also sometimes uh, developers make system to system connections. So you, you can have a major system handling, for instance, DNA sequence data, such as Magnify. And Magnify is a, a project or a unit in the European campus of GeneBank, and they handle metabarcoding data. So before this data set appears to GBIF, and between Magnify work, there are no human involvement other than coding the connections. And sometimes the systems to systems connections are very valuable because Magnify publishes a huge number of data sets. It's simply impossible to handle for humans, but you can notice that description and methodology is quite slim compared to what I was showing to you before. It's not Magnify's fault, but it cannot get richer if people who, are, who, who originally published it through GeneBank didn't put the rich metadata there. So in a way, working on your metadata is a responsible step for the data holder. Once you realize that these data are useful not for you or your project exclusively, once your cultural evolution happened in your head, you need to take responsibility for that reuse. And uh, that is a not very comfortable thought, I have to admit, because it will cost you time and effort. But um, as you can see here already, there are people benefiting from this data. You can see this little data citation box in the corner. And this is how many times one, 10, or maybe all records from these data sets were useful for someone since 2018. For a DNA derived data set, this is a high number. So your research, your academic outputs can be discovered and reused, not only because you published wonderful papers in science and nature, but also because you generated quality data sets. I know I'm hitting my time limit very soon. So I, I will close by showing you a very contrasting example from Pangea, which published a lot of data sets, 7,000, also automatic connection to GBIF. And for instance, we can take this dinoflagellate cysts many people involved, uh, but uh, the metadata you find here is basically names of people. It passes minimum threshold of publishable through GBIF, but for me, the criterion of good and bad metadata is very simple. Can I use or reuse this data without writing a single email to people who generated them? If the answer is yes, your metadata is good enough. Uh, so, you, can, you should look at your own metadata and your data set with, through the eyes of the external. Is it complete, comprehensive, understandable enough for someone who is not you? And that's the point of putting effort into the quality metadata. And we try to explain it in detail in this Guide to Better Science of British Ecological Society. This is not sponsored by them, but I, I happen to help them a little bit. So. So this is, um, exists in a paper or PDF version. I can put the link to, to the chat after I finish. And it has uh, basically the same advice that I'm giving to you here. Pay attention to metadata because this is the first thing that anybody will bump into before attempting any collaborative or data reuse project. And neglect of metadata will translate into the neglect of your effort and of your data. So it is, a very important thing. And um, I would like to close with two slides I was not planning to share, but I think they sort of uh, continue the topic started by Anders. If I have time still, Chloe, can I do that? Or better not? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Right, so um, I just showed two slides from my deck, which I prepared for some other purpose. But uh, you see it full screen or not? No, we see presenter view now. Okay, right. So there are two questions when you have uh, that you should ask yourself about the data and the metadata sharing. One is the when question. And for academics, especially in a very competitive stage of your career, this is an important one. 
there may be a other research group about to publish a similar study. You might be restricted by the rules of your dissertation committee of your journal and the data should only come with, not before the publication, things like that. So it is an easy question because as long as you share it at some time point, it doesn't matter. So the wrong answer is not to share, share it again and to let it die with the hard drive of your computer. So I hope you're not these kind of people. But the where people, uh, oh, sorry, the where choices, they are very important for metadata questions because many people live in the illusion that dropping their messy Excel file somewhere online is open data enough. Yes, it's open data because people can discover it in theory, but in practice, nobody go there to the graveyard to dig it out because it's not reusable. And that echoes the fair uh, slides of Anders. So archival or putting to the generalist repository doesn't do the job of the data discovery and reuse. There are data catalogs where you would standardized metadata uh, and uh, through that, for instance, you can go and find all the data sets on Coleoptera. But still, there will be no standardization of data maybe, and you'll have to do all the messy table to table uh, merging. And I think many of you in ecology know how painful that can be. Um, and we hope that we represent the better end of the fair spectrum where we provide data index, where both data and metadata are standardized and they're provided with a DOI, which um, uh, provides your, the, the best we can offer at the moment, discoverability. So I think that's the end of my speech and um, I hope it was useful. It, it is not really a lecture of what metadata is and how to use it, but it is kind of a teaser talk to um, invite you to pay attention to this very important aspect of the data exchange, especially in ecology. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dimitri. That was uh, very impressive. I probably have quotes from you now that will serve me for many years uh, into the future. Um, but you also really brilliantly set the stage for Don to now talk a bit more about the where questions and repositories. So I think we're just gonna head straight over to Don now. Sorry, trying to figure this out. I'm having issues with my setup this morning, and I also have to apologize for my um, nasal voice. Uh, COVID has been sweeping through the house over here, actually burning through the house, and so I, I've been hit. And uh, um, and yeah, so you have to put up with, with this nasal voice. But uh, yeah, it was fantastic listening to both of these talks. Um, I am going to follow up then with um, how to um, choose a data repository. Um, so do you see my slides now? Yeah, okay, perfect. All right, so um, yeah, we've heard lots about um, data standards and metadata and another very important component about sharing your data is you know where, where do you put them? Um, so if I can get these slides to work. There we go. All right. I was just going to start with a little bit of history, actually. So in ecology and evolution, um, you know, the, the talk about kind of sharing data and, and data repositories, especially, um, uh, kind of began around the time of uh, this joint data archiving policy, which was kind of originated with the creation of the first uh, major repository in ecology and evolution called Dryad. Um, and so at, in around like 2011, uh, a series of uh, editorials were written by um, fairly well-known ecologists in journals like AMAT and uh, Molecular Ecology and JEB and others and others basically saying, hey, it's time that we start sharing our data people and we have created um, this policy um, that, that guides you through how you should be sharing, um, and a number of journals have adopted it. And we've also created the platform for you to start sharing your data. It's called Dryad. Um, and, and since 2011, uh, more and more journals, not just in ecology and evolution, but you know, in, in kind of generalist journals and journals and other disciplines have also started requiring authors to share their data. 
These are just a couple of examples, but there's lots of them out there. Um, in fact, with a, a student recently, we did a bit of a survey of the journals in ecology and evolution to get a sense of how many of them um, require authors to share their data. So if you're interested in that, um, this is, uh, we call it the living database of journal data policies in ecology and evolution. Um, living because we plan on updating it. Um, if you find any any uh, erroneous uh, entries in there or, or anything that needs to be updated, let us know. But essentially, um, to give you a bit of a, a picture of what's happening in our field right now, um, you know, we, we, we found that 40 of the 199 journals that are listed uh, in Web of Science under Ecology and Evolutionary Biology require open data. Um, so that's 20%, you know, one out of five, it's not bad. Uh, about the same amount, um, well, 17% basically um, require a data availability statement. So that's to say the authors have to disclose, um, you know, where the data are, but they don't necessarily have to share them. So um, the statement could be, well, data are available on request. and. And there's been excellent research by Tim Vines here in Canada um, showing that you know that's not all that effective. So data availability statement is, is not a bad thing. We want those to be there, but we also want people to share share the data in repositories. Um, so about you know 37% only recommend open data, and there is about a quarter of the journals or a bit more that have absolutely no data policy. Um, I just saw this go by. Um, was it this last week, basically, March March 30th? Um, this is a post on a blog that I, I like very much, The Scholarly Kitchen. Um, and uh, this was written by Mark Hannell, who is the founder of Figshare, which is a, a quite a well known repository, general repository. Um, and essentially, this was just a graph that he put together showing the name, number of DOIs that were created across uh, a bunch of different repositories that are generalist repositories like Figshare. Joy, uh, Dataverse, I'll talk about these in a bit, um, and, and uh, across the years, basically. And, and you know, this was to show that you know, from 2011, where when very few data sets were archived, the numbers have increased quite dramatically over the years. So we're now at around like, you know, 2021, 25,000 data sets are being deposited in these repositories. And, and clearly, that's not everything, right? So for example, GBIF uh, and others are, are not here. Um, so why why share in a repository? Um, well, first of all, you know, as uh, Dmitri and Anders have mentioned, um, it avoids your data being lost to science, right? So people die or hard drives break, and um, you you can lose your data yourself. But you know, if you die um, and the data lives on your your hard drive, um, it is lost to science because no one will ever be able to access uh, and let alone understand it. Um, you know, some people share data on their websites, but websites are ephemeral. I think everyone knows about um, URL decay. Um, journals are ephemeral too. So if, you know, some journals go belly up and if you happen to have shared your data on their platform um, or, or in supplementary material, um, that might be lost as well. Um, Speaking of supplementary material, a lot of people tend to share their data, or a lot, I mean, some people tend to share their data in supplementary material, and I mean, that's definitely not considered best practices, uh, in part because um, journals are often paywalled, and so is their supplementary material, so the data are not necessarily open, and also um, many journals don't index their uh, supplementary materials, and so um, the data sets end up being not, not findable. You can't use um, uh, search engines to scour through supplementary materials and uh, and find relevant data. Sharing your data on a repository is also great because it boosts collaboration. Dmitri alluded to that. Um, if people can find your data, they might be interested in them and they might contact you and want to collaborate um, and work on a project with you, which might, might you know lead to, to uh, papers being published with you as co-author. Um, very importantly, you get a DOI when you archive your data on a, a recognized repository. And that's great because your data set can then be cited. Um, we saw in Mitri's slides that you know, data sets can be cited a lot, which is, which is fantastic. Other people use it, and then um, you get credit for that. Um, another interesting aspect um, is that uh, open data has also been found to be associated with an increase in the citations of the original paper um, where uh, the data were, were used the first time. So 
there's there's three actually studies that have been published um, showing that um, sharing your data is associated with an increase in uh, the citation rate. So two of them by Heather Pivovar, who's quite well known here in Canada, and then one, the most recent, by um, Olavitza et al. Uh, in 2020. So clearly sharing your data, um, or at least there, there seems to be strong evidence that sharing your data is good for your citation rate. And that, that you know, just to say why is that, I don't know, and you can kind of interpret that however you want, but I think that th that main underlying reason here is that people might have more confidence in, you know, papers that have open data, or it might also be that people, um, you know, build on or reuse um, data and the information in papers where um, there's more transparency. Um, and then finally, you know, another reason why you might want to share in a repository is because, um, well, it allows you to comply with a journal or a funding agency's policy to share your data. And there's also options for you to kind of safeguard your data if you want, um, if you have uh, planned reuses for these data. So, for example, if I've collected the data for a paper, but I want to reuse it for another paper in my PhD thesis, um, I might not want to make these data public right away because um, I'm worried that maybe someone might want to do something with these data that overlaps with what I have planned for my second chapter. Well, one option for that is to archive your data on a repository, make sure that it's safe, that it's going to become public, but put it under what's called an embargo. And so um, these things exist. Uh, um, some repositories actually allow you to select uh, a one-year embargo, no questions asked, you just tick a box and then your data are archived and they will become public um, in a year. But um, in a study that I did with some colleagues in 2014, we also found that, you know, there's a range of different embargoes out there um, on data repositories. So this is uh, some data for Dryad, um, the repository that I mentioned earlier. Um, this graph here shows the number of embargoes uh, and uh, as a function of the, the years, basically, under which the data were kind of um, embargoed, so, so kept from becoming public. Um, and you can see that, you know, there's most of the data released immediately, but there are quite a few here, actually, that, that range all the way up to 10 years. Um, so it is possible for people working on long-term data sets, for example, to ask that their data be uh, archive but kept private for for up to 10 years and and this graph here just shows you kind of these these embargoes from two years and up um, across the different some different journals here that you might be familiar with in ecology and evolution all right so um you know just briefly what types of repositories um, are out there for you to use well one kind of major distinction is uh, institutional versus international repositories um, so institutional repositories are generally for researchers who work at these institutions. They're maintained by universities often. Um, these are you know, some examples. For example, James Cook University in Australia has its own repository. This is one maintained by a number of different Swiss universities together. Um, this is one by Boston University. Um, but I would say that most people tend to use now these what I call international or non-institutional repositories which are for anyone to use um, so gbif that we heard about is a really good example genbank which is for um, sharing gene sequences and um, other very well-known ones like zenodo and the open science framework i'll come back to these um, in a sec um, and then there's also these interesting kind of hybrid ones here where um, they're they're considered i mean the the repositories themselves are international if you want, but um, institutions can kind of link up with them to create within this repository an institutional repository. So they can feature research or data sets, um, sorry, data sets by their own researchers, but those are kind of broadly discoverable on a general repository or international repository like Figshare or uh, the Dataverse. So uh, another way to kind of separate um, or partition repositories, if you want, is uh, uh, as disciplinary or discipline specific um, versus generalist repositories. So, um, you know, disciplinary repositories um, would be uh, for specific areas of uh, biology or ecology and evolution. Um, if you were to go to the website of Scientific Data, which is a, a journal that publishes data sets, 
Um, they have some pretty useful recommendations in there or kind of information on the different types of repositories. Um, and so here's an example of some of these disciplinary repositories that you know they would direct you to. So in biology, you can look for repositories that share nucleic acid sequences, protein sequences, uh, taxonomy and, and species diversity, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have um, other kind of generalist repositories that accept uh, a range of different data sets, um, irrespective of the specific field um, that they uh, belong to. So here um, in, uh, oh, I've just realized that actually I've been using my, my uh, pointer, but I don't think you can actually see that. <laughs> there we go, better. Um, so uh, yes, here, here are some examples, basically, of these disciplinary repositories. So GBIF, um, which is you know the for, for biodiversity um, the polar data catalog is one that people use often in Canada you know obviously it has to be polar data GenBank is for gene sequences data stream is one that's specific again to Canada I apologize for using Canadian examples here um, but uh, yeah so essentially anything that has to do with rivers um, in Canada freshwater you can put that up in in uh, data stream um, generalist repositories, so well-known ones are, are Dryad in Ecology and Evolution, um, FigShare, I mean, FigShare, you can put anything up there, um, and, and they accept data, but they can also accept other, other types of research outputs. Zenodo is a very well-known that's maintained by CERN, and then there's the Open Science Framework, which is maintained by the Center for Open Science. And there are others, but these are just some examples. Um, yeah, so you know, if, if you're looking to kind of find or, or, or select repositories that are uh, relevant to you, um, useful websites would be um, our you know, Re3 data, um, where this is essentially this is a registry of research data repositories. Um, and you can go um, browse their website. And then also, if you wanted to select repositories, for example, that, that meet certain criteria, like the FAIR data project, you could, you could go there and, uh, and click on this link. Um, one important thing to know also is that, you know, because there are so many data repositories out there, you might wonder, well, you know, how do people find data that are kind of spread out in all of these hundreds of repositories that exist? Um, there's an excellent paper by Antitza Kulina that was published in 2018 um, in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution that kind of talks about that. And um, I think this, this figure is quite useful because it shows, you know, it illustrates this, you know, all these different places where you can put your data. Um, whether it's published through a data journal, often the data lives in a repository anyways, but all these different repositories can be searched um, using these uh, aggregators of data repositories. And there's quite a few. Um, one of them that people often forget about is um, Google Dataset Search. If you're not aware of this, um, you should go check it out. Just punch that in. If you use Google, put Google Dataset Search in Google, and then the search engine will pop up. And you, know, you can put any keyword that you'd like and find data sets that are, um, that are relevant. So um, I realize that I'm, I'm running a little bit over here, but I'll try to uh, plow through um, these, these last couple of points. You know, uh, I find, so again, on, on this website for the journal Scientific Data, um, I was kind of browsing through this and there are a couple who are thinking about what are, what are the requirements? You know, what's useful when you're looking for a, a data repository? And so this is what, um, what Scientific Data recommends. Um, your repository should ensure long-term persistence and preservation of data sets. It should be supported by a research community or a research institution. Um, it should provide deposited data sets with stable and persistent identifiers. Um, often these are digital object identifiers, DOIs. Um, it should allow access to data without unnecessary restrictions. So the option to choose um, different licenses to publish your data. Um, sorry, so this is kind of similar to that. So provide clear terms of data use and data access. Um, and one thing that I think is quite important also is that it should facilitate anonymous reviewer access for embargoed data. So if you um, are going to submit a paper for review um, and you haven't made your data public yet, many repositories will allow you to create a private link, which is something that you can share with the editors and the reviewers at a journal so that they can have a look at your data um, while they review your paper. 
before you've actually pressed make the data set public, right? Um, so you can use this for embargo data, but you can also use this if um, you want to make sure that, you know, your data are reviewed or looked at before you um, put them out there in the public domain. Um, you know, these are other kind of criteria that I've added, which are not part of the list, but I still think are important. Um, are there costs or restrictions for archiving? Some repositories like Dryad, for example, charge fees to um, archive data. If your journal doesn't pay, some journals pay the fee of Dryad, but if they don't, it'll cost you $90 to archive your data of Dryad. So maybe, um, you know, if that's a concern for you, other repositories that are free, like Figshare or Zenodo, uh, might be better options. Are there limits on the file sizes of the data that you want to, uh, that, that you can upload on the repository? Is version control supported? Can you upload new versions of the data and the previous versions are, uh, are preserved? So it keeps track of the history. And, and also importantly, is there an embargo option if that is relevant to you? Um, so just to kind of wrap this up, um, there are uh, kind of criteria or, or principles, if you like, that can help you uh, ensure that your repository is a good one. So this is a paper published in 2020 that outlines these trust principles for digital repositories. Um, and they, they have to do with, you know, uh, transparency, responsibility, user focus, sustainability, and technology. And so there are a couple uh, organizations that will certify repositories as being kind of trust compliant. And if you want to know what they are, you can um, look at this paper or just visit, um, for example, the website of the core trust seal and they list what these repositories are on there. Um, yeah, so that pretty much kind of, um, you know, cover, covers it. It's a short overview of what, what um, are data repositories and how to choose them. If you want additional resources, I would recommend this paper um, that I mentioned previously by Antitza Kulina and others. Um, here are also some um, excellent resources on repositories. I'll, I'll share my slides after with Chloe and she can distribute them. And then obviously, um, if you uh, want to know more about data repositories or anything open science, um, you should consider joining the Society for Open, Reliable and Transparent Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Um, this is what we eat for breakfast in the morning. So come join us. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dom. That was really nice. So we now know a lot more about repositories and I also learned that there is a Google data search. I actually did not know that until now. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule now, but in any case, we're going to stop the recording now. Uh, Sorry, I'm gonna... Uh.